A religious order founded in 1970 by two friars and established by Pope John Paul II 20 years later as a diocesan institute, the Franciscans of the Immaculate are totally consecrated to the Immaculate Virgin in imitation of the heroic life of prayer and poverty as exemplified by St. Maximilian Kolbe. In this episode, it was my honor to speak with one of the friars, Father Jose Maria Barbin, who spoke of his vocation journey the impact of St. Maximilian's example for all of us, and the beauty of a life spent in humble service of the Immaculata. Well, Father Barbin, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, what, a, what an immense joy um, to talk with you about uh, my favorite saint, and I think a lot of people's favorite saint, St. Saint Maximilian Kolbe. Um, he has been just so instrumental in, in my reversion, I would say, not conversion, but reversion and my spiritual journey and how he leads us all to the Immaculata. And so I um, really appreciate you coming and, and sharing uh, a little bit, you know, your perspective. So thank you. Um, so to kind of get us started, I wanted to ask, um, can you share a little bit about your own faith journey and what drew you to the Franciscans of the Immaculate? Most oh, definitely. Uh, thank you, Paul, for having me on your channel. And uh, yeah, that definitely, you know, by the grace of God, I was, uh, I'm a cradle Catholic. Mm -hmm. I was born in the Philippines, which, as you know, is very culturally Catholic. And uh, my family moved to Toronto, Canada when I was very young. And it, I was just your typical average, uncatechized Catholic who went through the motions, really. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it wasn't until late high school where I was really moved various reasons to take my faith seriously. And I, I remember praying at church one day <clears throat> and just telling our Lord, look, I have no idea what I am doing. Just made this very sincere prayer. And I was, as I was leaving the church, there was a, a bookshelf, a book rack, and there was only one book on that shelf. And the title of the book was The Secret of the Holy Rosary mm -hmm. by St. Louis Grignon de Montfort. And on the bottom, the corner of the book, there was a sticker that said free, you know, so, so I grabbed that and um, the Holy Spirit just convinced me mm -hmm. of the power of the Holy Rosary. And I told Our Lady, Blessed Mother, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I promise to pray your Holy Rosary if you guide me. Mm -hmm. And she did, you know, she guided me little by little. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, one of my friends was very instrumental in uh, introducing me to a very holy priest who personally knew St. Jose Maria Escriva for many, many years. Mm -hmm. So just after years of spiritual direction mm -hmm. with this holy priest, the desire to consecrate myself to God just started to grow. And I knew that mm -hmm. I wanted to do it to, to give myself entirely to God through the Immaculate to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And at that point, I knew of St. Maximilian Kolbe. Mm -hmm. So I tried to research on different orders, um, who was the most Marian, what, what is the most Marian reality in the church? That was basically the question. Mm. And I stumbled upon the Franciscans of the Immaculate who as, a, as an institute is called to, to, um, to advance the legacy, the heritage of St. Maximilian Kolbe. Mm -hmm. And they also have a Marian vow. So as Franciscans of the Immaculate, we profess not only the evangelical councils, but also the Marian vow. Mm. So once I heard of that, it was a done deal mm -hmm. and the rest is history. Oh, wow. That's so beautiful. Yeah. yeah it's funny. Cause you, you talk about discovering books on bookshelves and like how mm. they can just kind of the efficacious way they can, they can imprint on you. Um, my, my own faith journey. So I was, uh, when I was 20, I was going to a secular public university, um, was raised nominally Catholic. I was a Chris, Christmas and Easter Catholic. And at the time I was a philosophy student. And so oh. I was in a used bookstore in our town and I was in the philosophy and religion section. And I was, you know, looking for some sort of book on like secular philosophy. I'm, you know, I don't even remember which philosopher at the time, maybe like Albert Camus or somebody like that. And, oh. And there was this, you know, so I'm like across from the philosophy shelves is the religion shelves. And I, you know, wasn't really all that interested, but I saw this <clears> one <throat> title and it said the death camp proved him real. 
And I was like, what, what is that? So I picked it up and it was the story about this Polish priest yes. who was in Auschwitz and he gave his life and he died. I mean, it, it was not a, a, a and I mean, no death is great, but particularly in a place like Auschwitz, but you know, I right. mean, it was a pretty agonizing way to go. Right. And it was just, I was, I mean, it was just fascinating. And that was my introduction to St. Max. Beautiful. And I mean, he's been with me and I, I mean, I could just go on and on, but you know, so it's just, it's funny how God will plant little seeds, you know, if you're just like, just at the right moment or, and right. it, our blessed mother, right. Just from her hand, I would say. Yeah. So yeah. Now, sometimes, you know, people get the wrong idea, I think, about Mary or about Catholic veneration of Mary, like it's that we pay too much attention to her, like right. it's some sort of competition with Jesus or something crazy. Yeah. And now, how would you explain the love that the Immaculata has for us to somebody who's thinking of it that way? And why yeah. in St. Max's you know, beautiful way of saying, he says, never be too afraid of loving Mary too much because you can never love her more than Jesus did. You know, exactly. so why, why shouldn't we be afraid of returning Mary's love? Right. Paul, great question. And the simple answer to that is this, because God himself did not, um, I mean, he loved her so much, God mm -hmm. himself. You know, if you read um, Pius IX's apostolic bull, Ineffabilis Deus, he says there that God from all eternity, so this is from all eternity, mm -hmm. predestined the Blessed Virgin Mary, uno iodemque decreto, in one and the same decree with the word incarnate. Mm. So what that means is God himself from all eternity in his mind, in his plan, mm -hmm. the Blessed Virgin Mary was inseparable from Christ himself. Mm. You know, so this is in the mind of God. Mm -hmm. And we know, as, as the Catechism tells us, there's a beautiful quote there, Catechism, paragraph 487. It says, what the Catholic faith teaches or believes about Mary is based on what it believes about Christ. And what it teaches about Mary illumines, in turn, its faith in Christ. There is no competition. Mm -hmm. So this inseparable inseparability between our Lord and our blessed mother is also present. We see this in sacred scripture, Paul, mm -hmm. right? In Genesis 3.15, you know, God tells the serpent, the woman and her seed mm -hmm. will crush his head. The woman. Mm -hmm. He already had the woman in mind. She is inseparable from Christ. And in the gospel, it's so clear that our Lord, the very first thing he did, he didn't preach. Mm -hmm. He didn't do miracles. He didn't do any of that. The very first thing our Lord himself did was he became a child of Mary. Mm -hmm. He became a child of Mary. Mm -hmm. And then he chose to dwell with Our Lady for 30 years, mm -hmm. hidden. And at the end of his life, he would entrust the Blessed Mother to the beloved disciple with the words, behold, your mother. Mm -hmm. So it's everywhere in sacred scripture. And St. Saint Paul, Saint Pope Paul VI puts it very well. We cannot be Christian without being Marian. Mm -hmm. Because if we are, as Christians, mm -hmm. alter Christus, we need to imitate his very life. We participate in his very life. Well, this is what our Lord did. He became a child of Mary. And we too need to be children of Mary. Oh, it's beautiful. And yeah, you know, I mean, Christ on the cross, it was his last gift to us was exactly. to bequeath his mother to us. Yeah. And, you know, uh, people don't, I, they don't, maybe they don't remember, you know, uh, they don't always remember, but like when Christ was dying, the crucifixion, he was just, in effect, he was drowning in his own blood, right? I mean, he was suffocating yeah. because the blood was filling his chest cavity and, you know, so for him to be able to speak from the cross, it was very difficult, you know? And so everything he said from the cross was exceedingly important, of course, but right. his last, I mean, really with his dying breath, pretty much was that he was bequeathing his mother to all of us. Exactly. And what a great gift, right? You know, I mean, the, the mediatrics of all graces and the yes. codentrix, you know, and yes. it's, it's not that she competes with Christ, but that she is there leading us to Christ. Like St. Louis said, 
you know, the surest, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but the surest, quickest way to sainthood is through Mary. Yep. Because she right, Paul, So it is, it's God's idea. Mm -hmm. And our Lord himself gives us his mother as a personal gift. Mm -hmm. So it's God's idea, you know? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, and, you know, one of her great knights, of course, uh, like St. Louis and, and, you know, St. John Paul II and Mother Teresa, but of course, one of her greatest knights is St. Maximilian Kolbe. Right. And uh, what has he meant to you on your personal spiritual journey? And what does his example mean for the church today? So, Paul, as you said, I mean, St. Maximilian Kolbe is such a fascinating figure. You know, he's such a, quote unquote, complete saint. Mm -hmm. you know, if you think about it, he's the saint of the Immaculate, the martyr of charity in Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. He's a missionary. He was a missionary in Japan in Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. He founded one of the most uh, successful magazines, and he was a spiritual leader of Neopokalanov, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the city of the Immaculate, where it was one of the largest, if not the largest, religious community at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's just such a fascinating saint. And the more you learn, I'm, the more I learn about him, mm -hmm. the more I pray about you know, his figure, his, his, um, his sanctity, I'm profoundly convinced that he is a prophetic character. He is a prophetic figure in the church today. Because, Paul, if you, if you think about it, in divine providence, mm -hmm. St. Maximilian Kolbe founded the MI the year 1917, mm -hmm. October 1917, the very same year that Our Lady of Fatima mm -hmm. appeared to the three children. And we also know that's when the communist revolution took place as well. Mm -hmm. So in the very year, that very year, we see in time a clash between the woman and the serpent, mm -hmm. right? And Benedict XVI would say that Fatima is a prophetic apparition of Our Lady. Mm -hmm. Prophecy in St. Thomas, St. Thomas of Aquinas would say prophecy after the apostolic age mm -hmm. consists and pertains to the guidance of human actions in a particular time of history. So if you think about the prophetic character of Our Lady of Fatima, the apparitions, it's the mother of God herself, the queen of heaven, mm -hmm. who is guiding the actions of her children in this present time in history. Mm -hmm. And St. Maximilian, we don't know if he knew of the apparitions. We certainly don't have documents on that, mm -hmm. but he embodied the message and the spirit of the Fatima apparitions and message. Mm -hmm. That's why he's such a prophetic character. You know, it's a gift to the church today, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I mean, we can probably assume that he probably didn't know about Fatima because, I, I, you know, certainly there was no internet, there was no social media, there was no oh. television. But radio was probably not even like much of a thing at that time. Plus he's a Polish priest. He knew right. Italian and Latin, but this was a Portuguese event. And so, and it was somewhat local, you know, so it's like, you suspect he probably didn't know about Fatima. Right. But this is you know all that tells you though, Paul. I'm sorry, what? That, that tells you that someone is orchestrating this. Yes. From on high. Yeah, for sure. And so <laughs> when, he's, when he's founding the MI, right? So, you know, famously he and the other six confreres, they found the MI at a time when the Freemasons are kind of running riot in Rome. And yeah. Freemasonry is, a, in, a, in effect, it's communist. It's very right. communist in its uh, philosophy. They're, they're really one and the same. And so you have the Blessed Mother talking about the errors of Russia spreading Right. right. And, you know, and then St. Max, who would go on to be one of her greatest advocates and saints and knights, you know, talking about, you know, founding this organization based on our Blessed Mother to combat those same errors, you know, and uh, that we have then seen play out in the last 100 years or so. Right. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. It's spot on. It's 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 eerily prophetic. Prophetic because. We're seeing that today, you know, Paul, I mean, the, the errors of communism is spreading, mm -hmm. it's spreading and we cannot, I mean, Archbishop Gomez was very clear in one of his, one of his, um, one of his statements there where the woke ideology is not simply an ideology. It's a false religion mm -hmm. and we should engage these false religions, 
not mm-hmm. only on a political or social level, but spiritually. Mm-hmm. We need super, supernatural means because ultimately, this is a historical expression between that cosmic battle mm-hmm. between the woman and her seed and the serpent and his seed. Mm-hmm. We already know who's going to win, though. You know, it's all about it's all about uh, choosing your team. Yeah, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, and it should be said in fairness, right? A lot of these like social justice movements, right? There is an element that is attractive to them. I mean, people people should be treated with dignity. You know, people should be treated with equality. I mean, a lot of that is like, well, yes, those are Christian values, but fundamentally where the rot comes in is rather than putting God as the primary focus, it's putting man or humanity as the primary focus. And so it, right. then it becomes, you know, what Bishop Sheen would call the uh, Archbishop Sheen would call the ape of the church. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, evil isn't it, it, you know, the problem with evil is not that it's ugly, it's that it's attractive. Right. And so, you know, people would do well to keep that in mind. But um, so my last question for you kind of jumping off of that is in yeah. terms of evangelization and outreach, which yeah. is desperately needed these days, what might we learn from the life of St. Maximilian that we can p- apply to today? Oh my goodness. So much, Paul, so much. <laughs> but I would say, you know, one of his, his last article, his last published article, actually, before he was arrested was an article on truth. Mm. It is such a beautiful article. Oh yeah. And he says that truth only truth is the basis for enduring happiness. Mm-hmm. Nobody can change truth, he says. Mm-hmm. We can only search for it, find it, discover it, realize it, and conform our lives to mm-hmm. truth, right? And it's so beautiful if you um, read the, the accounts of um, his last conference, basically in Auschwitz. Mm-hmm. So imagine St. Maximilian in Auschwitz. And we have witnesses who's, who, who, who testified that St. Maximilian was giving them conferences. Hmm. And the conferences were on the mystery of the most holy trinity mm-hmm. and the mystery of the immaculate conception in her relationship to the three divine persons mm-hmm. in Auschwitz. Who does that, Paul? <laughs> who does that? Yeah. But I mean, that's the genius of St. Maximilian. You know, in the midst of Auschwitz, the question that he had was, how do I, not, not how do I get out of this, but mm-hmm. how do I unite my heart to the hearts of Jesus and Mary? Mm-hmm. That is founded only on divine truth. Mm-hmm. Because truth, as St. Thomas would say, transcends the moment and takes what's happening in the moment mm-hmm. and puts it in their proper perspective. So first of all, St. Maximilian teaches us, teaches us that, you know, to found our lives on the word of God, mm-hmm. the eternal truths that never change, and the only basis of enduring happiness. And secondly, he gave his life trying to spread the truth through the Immaculate, mm-hmm. through the Immaculate. Mm-hmm. Now, this is so, so important, Paul, especially for evangelization. In sacred scripture itself, we see that when the disciples first received the Holy Spirit and then evangelized, who was present at the cynical? Mm -hmm. At the center was the mother of God. Mm -hmm. Only then, after they were filled with the Holy Spirit, did they go evangelize. Now, St. Luke is a very careful author because he was divinely inspired to write not only Acts, but the gospel of his gospel as well, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look back to his gospel and parallel that with Acts, you will see that the proto-Pentecost and the proto-evangelization was the Annunciation Mm -hmm. and the Visitation. Mm -hmm. The first, when, 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 uh, at the Annunciation, when our Lord, when, when, when uh, the Blessed Mother conceived Mm -hmm. through the Holy Spirit, the mystery of the Incarnation took place. And then she went to bring this good news to St. Elizabeth, her cousin. So this is the pattern that we need to take for evangelizing others. It's a Marian pattern, right? And it tells us that this is the primary of grace, primacy of grace. Mm -hmm. This is not a natural work 
it's a supernatural work. And Our Lady being the mediatrix of all graces mm -hmm. is at the center of this work. As St. Louis Grignon de Montfort would say, the Holy Spirit does not act without his spouse, the Blessed Mother. Oh, absolutely. And I, I encountered a quote, and I hope I'm getting this right. And it's from St. Maximilian, but it's basically, it's talking about the wedding of the uncreated Immaculate Conception, which is yes. the Holy Spirit, and the created Immaculate Conception, which is our Blessed Mother. Yes. And St. Maximilian, I think he said in effect that they are so close that in a sense, it could be said that Mary you know, because she's so perfectly aligned to the will of God that, you know, it's basically, you know, hers and the will of God is one. Now yes. he's very, he's very careful not to say like, Mary's not a divine person. And we're not saying that, you know, she's not God or anything like that, but it's that she's such a perfect reflection, uh, the human reflection of what God wills for humanity. Yeah. You know, that she reflects that back. So she's our perfect model. Right. 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 So that's, uh, that's actually, that's such a deep mystical intuition that St. Maximilian received, mm -hmm. you know, just before he was arrested. Mm -hmm. It's centered basically on the spousal union of the third person of the divine, tr of the Trinity and our blessed mother. Mm -hmm. That spousal union he calls the uncreated immaculate conception mm -hmm. and the created immaculate conception. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, um, Our Lady of Lourdes, 1858, I believe it was, mm -hmm. Our Lady revealed her name. She said, I am the Immaculate Conception. Mm -hmm. And this revelation of her name profoundly moved St. Maximilian Kolbe. Mm -hmm. And basically, he was given the grace to understand it in terms of this spousal union. You know, it's, it would be deep to, to go into this, but it's such a beautiful mystery. Such oh, a beautiful yeah. Mystery. No, so we do well to follow St. Max's example and, and, you know, really give our lives over to the Immaculata and yes. try to be as best we can fit instruments in her immaculate hands for the Definitely. salvation of souls and to lead people to Jesus. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, Father Barbin, I am really, uh, really appreciative of talking with you today. And, you know, I love talking with people who are, you know, fellow St. Max fans, if we can say it like that, but uh, <laughs> I am, I am really very pleased to meet you and have this, this time to talk. Would you, would you be so kind as to pray for, for me and for all our listeners and viewers and just give us a blessing that we can take away, please? Most definitely. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Paul. Thank you, Paul, for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to meet you and you. I'll leave you with my blessing. All right. With the intercession of the blessed Virgin Mary, the almighty God bless you and keep you. May he show his face to you and have mercy on you. May he turn his countenance toward you and give you his peace. May the Lord bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you. All right. Thank you.